Hey, what is up, everybody? Today is an arbitrary day of the week, and I wanted to talk about the ending of base set. Now, I am working on a bit of a retrospective video that will go over the kind of the entire history from the beginning of the announcement of Lestrals up until the last tournament on May 11th. And I wanted to, before that kind of comes out, because that's going to be a bit as I'm working on it, uh, I wanted to talk about base set now while it's relevant before Frostfall comes out. Because once Frostfall comes out, new format, etc. It's already technically out on the app. Uh, but I wanted to talk about base set before it becomes quote-unquote irrelevant. So that's what this video is about. Uh, before I continue, however, if you're watching this as this video comes out, I am running a giveaway currently. Uh, there's a code for the giveaway. Plug that into number two and you'll get another giveaway entry. Uh, anywho, yeah, check out my giveaway, all that cool stuff continuing with what I was talking about today. So base set has been out for almost two years. It was announced about two years ago, I should say. Announced about two years ago, we started playing it maybe a month or two after it was announced. I have the dates written down, I'm not gonna look them up right now, but a couple months after it was announced, uh, the prototype decks were shown off, what the decks were gonna have in them, and I created the tabletop simulator for the game as well. So before the prototype decks were even printed, I actually have one right here, before these were even printed, we were playing the format on Tabletop Simulator where some of the cards actually got changed before these actually got shipped out to people, which is a little funny, but there's a large community input on base set on how it was kind of balanced, where everyone who was checking out the game on Tabletop Simulator, uh, checking the game out on those prototype decks, etc. We're giving feedback to Dan and things were being adjusted on the fly, like immediately, almost immediately, Aeolus went from Disenchant 1 to Disenchant 2 because it was immediately apparent that card was too strong. And I really want to highlight this part of Lustrals here because I think that's one of the reasons that made the game so functionally interesting and went pretty well is because there's so many people interested in playing the game off the bat and getting on Tabletop Simulator to constantly check and readjust and do changes based on what Dan was giving us. Kind of, We gave feedback to Dan. Dan gave us new cards with new art, well, not new art, but new card effects to tinker around with in Tabletop Simulator to give him more feedback, and it really helped the game improve a lot, I would say. Like, that community aspect for base set is what made base set, in my opinion, a phenomenal set. I really do think that base set went extremely well. There's not much I would really want to change in base set because with a lot of changes to base set, we would see drastically changes in the format. Like... For example, there was the one tournament where they decided to do all counter runes are limited to one. That was interesting, but it immediately made wind incredibly powerful. Because the game was balanced with all the cards kind of in mind and playtesting, etc. Now there's obviously the feels bad with Spark It. And I say this a lot, Spark It got a buff, Astrapa got a buff, because in our playtesting originally, Thunder just was the worst element. Even worse than fire because it couldn't hold a board state at all most people ran a one of thunder spirit in their deck for rice arrows which is the only thunder spirit that could actually or thunder illustrial that could hold the board state so thunder needed something that had five defense that was that strabbit for better or for worse and where was it going with this community input i think would help made illustrials great now obviously people have their complaints oh it's super counter heavy which makes the game pretty interactive so that's a pros cons uh, ascensions aren't super viable. I don't necessarily think that's an issue with ascensions themselves as the mechanic. However, a lot of the ascensions were lackluster in their power levels. Where you look at something like Centarbor in a bubble, that's a very powerful card. It's really, it's not really difficult. It's too difficult to get out. If you could get Centarbor out, it's a really nasty threat. Centarbor plus Holy Forest is incredibly powerful. Just getting there is too difficult. But then you look at something like Vol Tempest, which is actually a playable three drop that is pretty good. And it basically, once it hits board, you win the game unless your opponent has exactly the tools to pick apart. So three drops kind of miss the mark because their power level is not necessarily the mechanic, which I think is something that people miss a little bit sometimes when they're talking about three drops is, oh, three drops are bad because they go down in card advantage, etc. Yes, but also we see three drops that work really well, like with Tempest, where they're easier to get out, they are powerful, but have, you know, the risk reward to them. Uh, additionally, the counter meta also helped a lot of decks be, like, if we say tier one, easily Thunder Nexus, Earth Beat Down, Wind Toolbox. Those are three decks that have all top tournaments and won tournaments. Then tier two, you have things like Krakatuga Burn, uh, 
The Underwater Stall, surprisingly, is the fifth best deck by uh, tournament results. Or the Underwater Control, I should say. The Underwater Stall, the Underwater Control. Fifth best deck by tournament. Surprising. Uh, and then, like, every deck after that, like, there's some more tier, tier 2 stuff, tier 3 stuff. But the fact that the counter runes were so relevant in the meta made a lot of decks super viable and kind of allowed a lot more people to express themselves, which I think was also a very beneficial thing for Lestrals. With 125 cards in base set, not pigeonholing people into having to play the top three decks just to play in the format competitively was a good thing. Like, yes, there's always going to be the best decks, but the fact that all these tier two, tier three decks could top at some point in the tournament. I mean, we saw Bears topping, we saw Chrysor win a tournament. Like, that's on the back of this counter rune meta where the counter runes were the important part and your deck expression was super diverse for the small amount of cards relative in the format which i think is really good um we're moving on to frostfall now which i think adds a lot of new toys to the mix new deck expressions to the mix but it doesn't really change the whole counter room meta so i still expect to see some of that happen now yes i know counter runes are frustrating for a lot of people uh people in general don't like being interacted with on, on their turns which is going for any tcgs you know you talk about magic gathering no one likes the blue player but they serve a necessary necessary evil. No one likes Gorgon's Gaze, but it serves a pretty necessary evil of, without Gorgon's Gaze, there's no way to stop a Lustral Effect. Now, Gorgon's Gaze could have been weaker. Um, I mean, we could talk about Gorgon's Gaze for hours. Uh, if you know anything about the history of Gorgon's Gaze, it was, when the game first came out, or when we first played testing, Gorgon's Gaze, honestly, in my opinion, I still hold to this point, people tell me I'm wrong, was not a good card. It Said it stopped ascensions, but due to how the rules resolved and change resolved, it did not stop ascensions. Uh, at least not effectively. Uh, it said it stopped abilities. However, the way his rules interacted, it didn't negate abilities. So you could still activate abilities, and if your Gorgon's in response, the abilities would still end up on the chain. Or if, like, I say normal cast a Sluggle, the Sluggle would still recover. Gorgon's Gaze wouldn't stop it. Like, it did some weird... Gorgon's Gaze was a rules interaction nightmare. And a lot of the rules for better change in the because of trying to make Gorgon's Gaze work effectively, which not a bad thing. Uh, Suppress got added. The chain system got changed like three or four times, if not more. I, I might be misremembering to make Gorgon's work how it was intended of just a stop button for anything Lustral based. The Gorgon's Gaze ended up being really strong. I think the biggest negative about Gorgon's Gaze is just really the fact that it's only in the Fire Starter deck when the Fire Starter deck isn't the best pickup, except for Gorgon's Gaze. I think Gorgon's Gaze is in a fine spot right now. Maybe it could have been a three cost, but it is probably the strongest counter in the game. Coming from not seeing as much play because it was honestly pretty bad before all the changes hit. Now it's a three of in every deck. Even now, even the people who back then told me Gorgon's Gaze was a hor was an amazing card. You should run it in every deck. They still ran it in their sideboard, not their main deck. What's up with that? <laughs> like, I know people were telling me back, like you know, a year and a half ago, Gorgon's Gaze is great. You should be running it. And I didn't believe them. I honestly wasn't running it. And then we had a uh, a small community tournament with Tabletop Simulator, and everyone who ran Gorgon's Gaze except for one person had it only in their sideboard, or their side deck. Checkmate. <laughs> and that, that's my little Gorgon's history anyway. Like, I don't want to talk about, again, I can talk about Gorgon's Gaze all day, but Gorgon's Gaze, I don't think it's a mistake. Maybe it could have been nerfed a little bit stronger. But while we're talking about counter mistakes, I've talked about this before. I would have preferred if more counter runes, and even more invoke runes, were in elements rather than neutral. I think one of the biggest pros for Gorgon's Gaze is not that it's just a good card, but you have no restriction in what deck it goes in, which having generic staples is helpful and good. Something like Pandora's Box, I think is fine as a generic card, but having something like Gorgon's Gaze have no restriction what deck it's going in, I think also limits the kind of potential of other cards to it. Uh, how do I explain that better? Gorgon's Gaze being a neutral rune is just, it's obviously an auto three you can include in every deck. If it was, say, two fire to cast, now in base set fire wasn't super strong, but now you'd have to kind of mix up your deck with fire. If you want an earthquake, you have to mix earth in the mix. You want tsunami, so all of a sudden you have these cards with elements on them. 
making it harder to include all of them. So I, I do believe that if Gorgon's Gaze was, I, I said this in a video a long time ago, if Gorgon's Gaze was fire, Shields of Achilles was water, Poison Tipped Arrow was earth, and then we have Tsunami's water, obviously. Like, those are the four staple kind of removal runes, or just interaction runes on your opponent's turn. Those all were elemental focused. You couldn't fit all of them into a deck consistently without drastically making your deck difficult to pilot. Uh, maybe five guys gets away with it being less focused on the cards and deck and more focused by the spear deck. You could probably manipulate it a little bit better, but that would have made the format, I think a bit more interesting, but it probably also would have made earth even better than it is because you would have a zero kind of spear deck include for poison to bear and earthquake, so to speak. But you know, if shield was like water, that would push water up a little bit better. If Gorgon's Haze was fire, that would make fire decks a little bit better because you wouldn't have to restrict yourself to adding a bunch of weird spirits into your deck. You'd just be in element. We see a little bit of Frostfall testing right now where fire decks are actually doing well because Lavalith, one of the best cards in Frostfall, is in fire. So you have a zero cost to include in your spirit deck to put Lavalith in your deck. I don't want to go into Frostfall too much right now. We're talking about base set. But that cost to include in your spirit deck is extremely important for a lot of splash effects. And it's something that makes, you know, earthquakes, like you can't really run three earthquakes if you're not running any other earth cards. You're running maybe two and two earth spirits because it's too difficult to. Uh, Thunderstorm should see more play in my opinion, but if you're not running Thunder and you're trying to put Thunderstorm in a deck, you're spreading your spirits thinner. And I think that's more interesting and I kind of wish that the direction the Illustrials was in right now. But again, as I mentioned way earlier in the video, that potentially makes, you know, some decks stand out more than they would have. Again, like, Wind destroyed a tournament where there was only one of each counter rune. So, unintended consequences, I should say. Things have really unintended consequences, so ultimately, I think where we ended a base set where we have three really high-tier viable decks that almost rock, paper, scissors themselves, and then a whole slew of, like, another 10 tier 2 decks is a really good space to be. Every single tournament graph that you look at is usually, like, Thunder Nexus, Earth Beatdown, Wind Toolbox, and then like 50% other decks, which is really good. And then you look at top cuts and you see, you know, six, five or six decks in every top cut. That's super diverse. If you look at other trading card games where there's some top cuts where you might see like 60, 70% of just one deck in top cut. And that makes it boring because then you're just playing mirror matches. And mirror matches, I don't personally like. I like decks, I like to play games where you're playing a new deck every time and your skill level and your kind of knowledge of what deck they might be playing and what tools they might have helps you improve and play better than them. That's my personal experience or my personal agreeableness or likes of formats. I just like super diverse formats where lots of things are viable because I like people to be able to express themselves with the decks that they run, but also play competitively with those decks. Whereas I know there's also a lot of competitive players who like to say, I like formats where there's, you know, three or four top decks, maybe two or three more decks that I have to think about, but I can prep for three or four matchups and play those matchups so I can be better at those matchups and improve and play better overall. And there's an argument for that, for sure. But I do like where we currently have a base set where the meta is pretty diverse, not excessively so, and... It just makes it more interesting, in my opinion, where someone can bring almost any deck and do decently well in a tournament. I brought a Majesty Ramp deck that was, by all accounts, horrible. Uh, would not recommend, but it's super fun. And I went 2-3, and three, and I only lost the game because one of my opponents accidentally cheated. I say accidentally cheated. He activated a counter rune on the turn that he said it, because we both kind of forgot. It was a very, very, very difficult board state to manage, and we both forgot that he just said it. So I could have gone three and two with Majesty Ramp, which shouldn't happen, but it happened, which is awesome. You know, like these weird tier four decks could still do well. Uh, I rambled a little bit there, but that's kind of where I'm at with base set. This video is getting a little bit longer than I intended it to. I'll have a retrospective coming out some point in the future for base set, uh, probably in a couple of weeks because it's going to take me a while to put it all together, B-roll, etc., but hey, if you're here still listening to this video, like and subscribe. I always appreciate that. Again, I have a giveaway running. Um, earlier in the video, I put the code up for that video. So you're going to have to go find that if you forgot to go look for it. And check out my giveaway if it's running right now. Uh, there should be a link to it below. 
and I'll see you guys in the next one, which might be a very long video or might be a gameplay. I don't know yet. We'll see. Have a good one.